Thank you. When I was a uh, graduate student at the University of California, Riverside, my mentor professor had the responsibility of collecting any uh, uh, the title pages of every book published up until the year 1800. They were gathering a database. And as a graduate student back in the early 90s, actually even in the late 80s, we were collecting, uh, the Amundsen Foundation gave oh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for us to, to fund this. And we advertised to every university, every library in North America. Oxford did it in the UK, University of Sydney did it in Australia and New Zealand, even in India, anywhere we could find English speaking books or, or a book published in any language in, in an English speaking country. And this went into what today is known as early English books online. If you belong to a university library or even if some of your public libraries that are well funded are now able to afford it. Um, and it goes all the way to 1800, which would be, well, that's the year that Thomas Jefferson won the presidency. So through our founding fathers even, uh, and it would be American books as well. But every book depository, university, every library was told, we will pay you per title page, and then they would Xerox the title page and send them into us. And we ensured that so far every book that has ever been published. And then what we did was paid them to, um, once we found out the books, I mean, if there were five copies, we'd only co contact one library and say, scan the entire book. These entire books are all online now. Everything published in English and even in other languages uh, up through the year 1800. Uh, but the thing is, book publishing is exponential. So, I mean, in, at the time of Gutenberg, you know, only the Gutenberg Bible, right? But then gradually, and by the time it gets to 1800, there's plenty of books. The neat thing is that when we set this up, um, there's a database, there's a search engine. And so, uh, anyway, I've spent my career studying the clergy of 40 years now, 1980, when I was working on my master's there, uh, I, I began work on the clergy of England in the 17th and 18th century. It would be the 1600s, that's the Puritans, and the 1700s, which would be the Enlightenment and our founding fathers even. So, um, well, anyway, uh, and then I started, even went back to Elizabethan, which would be 16th or the Reformation period as well, Henry VIII. Um, but what I did was, uh, in fact, I'm introducing my book, which is up here. Sorry for the shameless promotion. The books are out there if you want. 20 bucks at the conference, 25 on Amazon. Well, 24.95. Um, anyway, what I did to, to make this, to write this book, was um, uh, one chapter was on the rapture. Actually, I had so much rapture stuff. I had two chapters: 17th century rapture in one chapter, 18th century rapture in the other. And I found and Everybody, in fact, what, okay, well, okay, for the first decade of my research, I was doing the politics of the clergy in the 17th and 18th century, whether they were Whig or Tory, whether they were monarchical or, or divine right monarchy, which was kind of a big political divide back in the 17th, 18th century. Um, and then I spent a decade on their scientific ideas. Basically, should we reinterpret Genesis 1 for an older earth? I found day age theory and gap theory 200 years before Darwin. So if anyone says, well, day age theory and gap theory came along because evolution, nonsense. 200 years before Darwin, people were saying, maybe the Earth's older, how do we explain this? But anyway, that was my, my next decade, and I published articles on that and everything. But in 2007, the students at our university, realizing that I was the dispensationalist and an outspoken one, and um, uh, another professor was a uh, Presbyterian replacement theology. The students wanted a debate between the two of us, and we got our largest auditorium, 230 people, I think, fit in the auditorium, jammed it full of faculty and, and, and students, and we had a debate. And in the midst of the debate, he said, all the stuff that Watson is talking about, it was invented by John Nelson Darby 150 years ago. It's new. It hasn't gone through church history, so it's not, it's not in the Bible. Don't believe it. And I looked at him and said, I've been spending, at that time, 30 years, now it's been 40 years, reading 17th and 18th century. Dar uh, Darby is in the 19th century, you know, the 1800s. 1830 is when he published his first work on dispensationalism. And so 
100, 200, almost 300 years before Darby, I was finding, and of course, the chapters on, on the, I just typed in rapture, collected all the, the any work that has the word rapture in it. Um, now, obviously, it'd have to be the biblical rapture, not, oh, I was caught in a rapture of ecstasy. Uh, you know, I wouldn't, I, I'd find that and say, don't need that. And then I did a chapter on di the word dispensation and a word search of all the stuff. And I found, again, in my, in my book, if you look at the back, last quarter of the book is nothing but bibliography. Hundreds and hundreds of sources that are talking about Darby's ideas, one, two, almost 300 years before Darby. Darby did not invent this stuff. Has nothing to do with some crazed Scottish girl, if you know anything about Margaret MacDonald. I mean, that's just nonsense. It's been totally blown away. And every idea that Darby had is, is found in, in some of these works. I don't think everybody got everything Darby got. My, next summer, we're going to be Airbnb, renting a place in Dublin and in Belfast, because all of Darby's own works, his... Um, his own letters and everything are at Trinity College in Dublin and at Queen's College in, in Belfast. So it'll be my summer of, every summer I go researching somewhere. Last summer, anyway, but my book came out two years ago. And then someone said, what are you gonna do next? I said, I'm gonna go earlier than the published works. I'm gonna go to manuscripts. And because I'm a professor, I have access to all the archives. Uh, I've read the archives at Oxford, at Cambridge, at, at the British Library. Uh, you've heard of the British Library, the, the biggest repository of manuscript, medieval manuscripts. And I've been digging around, and the best one I've found so far is on the right there, uh, and that is a dissertation on the Antichrist. It is in Chaucerian English, Wycliffe, the period of Chaucer and Wycliffe. It's in Gothic, Middle Gothic, and uh, in fact, I even had to teach myself to read Gothic, but it's, it's a nine-page manuscript, and it and it talks about, in order for the Antichrist to be revealed, he has to desecrate the temple. The temple in Jerusalem doesn't exist anymore. So you have, the Jews have to rebuild their temple in Jerusalem. To do that, the Jews have to return to Israel, rebuild Jerusalem, and rebuild their temple in order for the Antichrist. This is his thinking, not, not mine. And by the way, as a historian, I just collect the data and, and I'm going to present to you the data of church history from the apostles to this document at the end of the medieval period, almost at the time of the... This is, predates the Reformation by 100 years. Wycliffe was a 100 years, a century before Luther. And, and so, but anyway, as an introduction to my scholarship and what I do, um, actually, this is my first practice on this presentation. I'll be, I hope you'll give me some criticism and I'll be able to improve my talk for the first week in December when I'm speaking at the pre-trib conference in Dallas that goes on every year, started by um, uh, Tim LaHaye and Tommy Ice and, and influenced, of course, by Walford and Pentecost and Ryrie, if you know who those guys were from Dallas Seminary. Anyway, let's go on with the talk. Here, here I am. You can't read historical eschatology, can you? But anyway, and of course, as I, I teach at Colorado Christian University, just about four miles south of here. What is the thesis of my paper? Dispensationalists expect at any time and speculate a lot upon the apocalypse. Here we are. Now, you may say, well, I'm not a dispensationalist. Don't have a narrow view of dispensationalists. I think if you're a dispensationalist, that's probably why you're here. At least I have a broad view of what a dispensationalist is. A dispensationalist is someone who, oh, here it is, uh, believes in the rapture. I don't care if you're pre-trib, post-trib, even just pre-conflagration, if you know what that is, we'll get to it. Uh, but in some kind of resurrection of the righteous at some time, um, you believe in the restoration of Israel, that there will be an antichrist, a battle of Armageddon, a second coming of Jesus. Now, I, I suppose not too many people here just call that allegory and really don't believe it's going to happen. It's just kind of figurative speech. But I would say that a majority of the clergy in this country, if not the, the laity, does believe that. So I would say that anyone that believes anywhere in the ballpark of that, I'm going to call them a dispensationalist. Hope you don't mind. Um, and, and we, the reason why we're here is we're speculating on the apocalypse. We're expecting Jesus to come back at any time. So you're a dispensationalist. Now, anti-dispensationalists disparage it. 
That man that, in 2007, when he said Darby came up with it, I turned to him and I said, I've been spending four, 30 years at that time reading, and I run across this dispensationalism all the time. In fact, back as a graduate student, I went to my professor and said, I don't think I want to do the politics of the clergy in the 17th and 18th century. I keep running into this great eschatology, and I want to do that. And he looked at me sternly and he said, Watson, you're a conservative Republican and an evangelical Christian. It's going to be hard enough getting you a university teaching position. And now you want to do your dissertation on this nutty stuff? So I did the politics of the clergy, Whig, Tory, divine right, monarchy. But in the back of my mind, I always wanted to do it. And that debate in 2007 said, forget it, I'm dropping everything else, and I'm going to spend the next decade of my life studying the eschatology. And after the book came out, of course, I said, I got to go back further. I got to go back older. And so, uh, as again, I was reading Gothic manuscripts, mainly in very early English. You say, well, why don't you go to the Latin? My Latin isn't that good. And I have a friend, I'll endure to introduce you in my talk, Francis Gummerlock. Francis Xavier Gummerlock. He was uh, born and raised Catholic, but now he is moving closer, I think. He's a Calvinist, um, reformed, amillennial. But he is probably the leading researcher in the world in Latin manuscripts with eschatology, the eschatology of Latin manuscripts. And we've become fast friends. And he keeps finding the rapture in medieval manuscripts. And I'm going to share a lot of them with you today. Um, so really, I mean, I, I do the English and he does the Latin, but the Latin goes way back. And he says, I, I keep telling him, you've got to become a dispensationalist. He says, why? You keep running into dispensationalist idea. At least he's an honest scholar. When he finds it, he goes, watch it. I found another one of these things you're going to go crazy for, <laughs> which I do. Anyway, let's move on. Prophecy is a major theme of the Bible, a major theme of Christ's teaching as well as being taught throughout church history. People will say, well, you know, after Constantine, people stopped talking about prophecy and it didn't come back again until the Puritans. I hear that all the time. I've taught that all the time. And you know what? We've found enough stuff, especially Gummerlock has. And then I've, I've been working on a lot of the church fathers myself in translation. Um, I, I would, boy, a great resource for you. Have you heard of the ancient Christian commentary? It's just been completed. They've been working on a lot of them. Matthew was the first they did. But it's a commentary, I mean, of every book in the Bible, a complete library of commentaries of every book in the Bible. And anytime any church father, when I say church father, I go all the way to the Crusades. So the thousand years after Christ, church father and early medieval period. Um, and every time they mention a passage of scripture, by computer, I guess computers are great. They've been able to find them and they've, been, they've put them into a commentary. In fact, my university library has, has them and I've been checking them out and, and digging through them. I, I, what I've been doing is going through my favorite eschatological passages like Matthew 24 and 25, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, you know, the Antichrist and 2nd Thessalonians 2. Uh, it's a, any good university, I would say Christian college, Christian university library or seminary library should have it. And just find one of your favorite eschatological books and go to that chapter and, and it'll have all the different church fathers and how they understood it. Yeah, some were Amil, some were not. And I'm going to present to you the ones that were not, obviously, because I want to show you that some, not everybody was Amil as my thrust. Anyway, um, so throughout, I'm, I'll now say dogmatically, and I've never heard anyone else say it, that eschatology was popular throughout church history, but the Roman Catholic Church never liked eschatology and tried to purge it, tried to do everything they could to stop it. So we'll, we'll look at that. Um, therefore, it is those who mock us who are new. We, we prophecy people are not the new people. They say, you know, that, like Dar Darby's new, therefore you can't believe it. Throughout church history, there have been prophecy people. And the people that disparage us are either those medieval Catholics who don't like eschatology because they want to force their agenda on us, or they are influenced by modernism, liberalism. They don't believe in prophecy secularism, and that has so influenced our churches, our seminaries, even our Christian colleges. 
a Colorado Christian when I was first there was on a liberal trajectory. And Bill Armstrong, who was US Senator in Colorado uh, d during uh, the Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, and George Herbert Walker Bush, close friend of Ronald Reagan's, he was the leader of the religious right in the Senate back in the 80s. Have you heard of him before? He was our president for the last 10 years. He just passed away recently, but he brought in hundreds of millions of dollars and we're putting a new multi-million dollar building every year there. And we're kind of a flagship of one of the most conservative Christian colleges around, both politically and evangelically. So, and we purged a lot of the liberals that were there when I first, in fact, when I first got there, I almost didn't get the job because they thought I was too conservative. And now almost everybody, all the new hires are more conservative than I am. <laughs> So there you go. Anyway, we've got to move on um, or I'm not going to finish this. Uh, here's a quote from Rabbi Hillel Silver at the one of the last slides is a uh, of the cover of his book. And Rabbi Silver wrote History of Messianic Speculation in 1927. Uh, it's really a, a, only Jewish authors and showing you that throughout history, Jews have expected that the prophecies of their Torah would be, it's a great book to get. You can get it on Amazon for about 20 bucks. Um, anyway, uh, Rabbi uh, Silver, and uh, he said in his foreword, Messianism thrives on suffering. It is its soil and sap. And in Israel, suffering was continuous throughout the centuries. No one has suffered more than Israel in its dispersion. The Jew never forgot the divine promise of redemption and expected to be returned. What, what's, the, what's the last thing that is said in the Seder? Next year in Jerusalem, they have never forgotten that they are going back to Jerusalem. The Christians may have poo-pooed it for a while, but I think we're getting back on the right track now. Anyway, so I would say my thesis would be apocalyptic literature is always produced by the oppressed. And I would say that if you're not really a Christian living for Christ, you're going to be a, you're going to be oppressed if you are. Anyway, so prophecy was very popular in Judea around the time of Christ, a couple centuries before, a couple centuries after. They were looking for their Messiah. Why? They were occupied by Rome and they were looking for their redemption. The early church, when it was persecuted by Rome until Constantine, was very eschatological, apocalyptical, if you will. Um, uh, but once it got comfortable at the time of go down to the bottom Constantine made Roman Empire Christian in the fourth century The church was now triumphant There was no need for a Messiah to rescue them Christianity had conquered Rome Or had Rome conquered Christianity We could get into that discussion too, but but the fact was Christians were feeling confident they didn't need a Messiah. Christ was ruling in his vicar, the Pope, in Rome. They were in the millennium. And all millennialism grew and was the official position of the Catholic Church. And other positions were then persecuted and censored and suppressed. But let's go back to the top. The medieval church. There were plenty of people I found in the medieval church that were apocalyptic, but they weren't official Roman Catholics. They were the oppressed. Maybe they were... Monks who were reading the scripture on their own and disagreeing with Rome. Some of them. Or there were groups that were cast out of the church. The Cathari, the Waldenses, the Apostolic Brethren. Wycliffe and his followers called Lollards. Huss and his followers called Taborites. They were all apocalyptic. Why? Because Rome was breathing down their neck and didn't like what they were doing. And most of them saw Rome, all of them saw Rome as the Antichrist. We'll get to that as my talk goes on. I get moving. Uh, then the early Protestants, when Roman Catholic armies started invading Protestant areas. I know of no instance where Protestant armies invaded Catholic areas. But as areas became Protestant, Rome felt they needed to, boy, if there's Roman Catholic here, you'll be offended. But hey, I'm historian. This is all catalog cataloged in history. The Catholic Church wanted to force them back into Rome and brought their armies. Hence, the Thirty Years' War, the religious wars in Europe shortly after the Reformation. Um, and of course, all those pro in that, those Protestant groups then, apocalypticism grew. 
They saw the Antichrist as the Pope in Rome. They were expecting a rapture. Things like that started coming up. And then finally, the next time we see a real growth in apocalypticism is in the late 19th and 20th century in America. And it's the fundamentalist Christians, the people who truly follow God's word, that were becoming apocalyptic in the dispensationalist movement of a century ago, the fundamentalist movement. Why? They were also persecuted by the growing liberalism in the church. Hence, the lib uh, once again, uh, the college where I teach was started in 1914 as Denver Bible Institute as part of the fundamentalist modernist controversy and the fundamentalist rallying together for a Bible college here in Denver. <sighs> anyway, uh, another time when they moved away from apocalypticism was Europe. When Europe began to dominate the world and, and European colonialists and even missionaries were going out and, and spreading Western civilization around the world, a new theology grew up. And that would be post-millennialism. And that is, we are going to make a perfect world through education, through bringing Western civilization to the heathen, you know, uh, through education. Uh, this, actually, what it grew into is progressivism, which itself is a religion. And, and in progressivism, we're going to continue progressing until we reach the millennium on earth. And the early ones were Christians in saying, well, when Christ comes back, he's going to congratulate us because we've done such a good time because we brought in the millennium for him. And I would say that's the religious fervor that you have. I don't want to talk about politics too much, but in those people who call themselves progressives in our political system today without mentioning any names or political parties. Well, this is kind of the traditional story that I've already told you that you will hear so much. In the first and third century, the church was premillennial. Um, I guess I can read it here. Uh, the most striking point in eschatology of the Antonicene, Anta means before, before the Nicene Creed. The Antonicene age is the prominent Kiliism or millenarianism. Uh, Kilia is the Greek word for thousand. So, thousand year millennium, uh, th that a belief of a visible reign of Christ in glory on the earth with his risen saints for a thousand years. Now, who, this was held by Barnab uh, Barnabas, Papias, uh, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Methodius, Lactan Lactantius, all of these early church writers who were pre-millennial. And the quote comes from Philip Schaff, who's one of the most respected church historians out there, even by the liberals. I mean, he's a biggie. And he himself admitted the early church was pre-millennial, not amillennial or post-millennial. Pre-millennial. Uh, another new source that did an awful lot of work, Paul King, in his work, Premillennialism in the Early Church, that came out in 2002, he cites at least 14 church fathers who were pre, not a, pre-millennial. And he has all their sources and everything. So I direct you to him. I've looked at him too, and I'm, my paper is influenced by him as well. Um, although Christianity began as a Jewish sect by the second century, it was overwhelmingly composed of Gentiles. And by the fourth century, it was the official religion and did not need a Messiah because they'd already conquered the Roman Empire. Increasingly, early Christianity departed from their roots and began to disparage their roots, which Paul warned us about back in Romans. In the 4th and 5th century, the growth in all millennialism, there is no millennium, or there's no literal millennium on the earth. You know, we're in the millennium now because Christ is ruling in Rome with his vicar, the Pope, because the vicar is the representative. So the Pope is Christ ruling from his throne. Um, now, Eusebius, who was really an apologist for Constantine, um, oh, there he is, apologist for Constantine, rejected the pre position, Funny how it's it, right about Constantine, they left premillennialism and went to amillennialism. Why is it that the, our theology is so often dictated by our circumstance rather than what the Word of God truly says? Anyway, the Messiah is now unnecessary, claim the idea of an early millennium was held by a great majority of the church. So even Eusebius said, yeah, a great majority of the church holds to the being a millennium, but it's not going to happen. We've, we've already got, we don't need the Messiah anymore. And Augustine, 
or Augustine, there's still a debate on how you pronounce that, promoted all millennialism, which then be, and even Augustine admitted that in his youth he was premillennial. But he said, there's no need for it now. We've conquered Rome. We've, we're in the millennium. Um, as papal power grew in Rome, replacing imperial power at the fall of Rome, there was no longer a need for a coming Messiah. A doctrine grew that Christ was ruling through his vicar, the Pope. When in the fourth century, Christianity attained to a position of supremacy and became the official religion of the empire, ecclesiastical disapproval of premillennialism became emphatic. The church was emphatic. Don't talk like that anymore. We're in the millennium now. So the only people who could hold otherwise were on the outs with the Catholic Church. And back then, if you're on the outs of the Catholic Church, you could expect a crusade or something like that going against you. Anyway, uh, I've said enough on this slide. We have to move on. Now, I've got some great sources I've discovered in the 5th and 6th century that, hold, that show the growth of apocalyptic pessimism at the fall of Rome. Hesetius, Bishop of Dalmatia, wrote about the second coming coming near. Why? Barbarians were coming. I mean, Attila the Hun had been marching through what is now Yugoslavia. It didn't make it all the way to the coast of Dalmatia. But, I mean, he was up in Croatia and Slovenia and that area. And, and he said, hey, that must be the Antichrist. We're coming towards the end. Um, Sulpicius Severus believed the Antichrist coming was very near. Um, Pope Gregory the Great. We get the Gregorian chants from, from Gregory the Great. Anyway, he said, the time when the end of the world is drawing nigh. All of these were expecting the end of the world at any time. Why? Because Gog and Magog are invading in the form of Attila the Hun, the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths and the Vandals and I mean, the Roman Empire. Many of the people I found believe that what was the, the, the restrainer of 2 Thessalonians 2 was the Roman Empire. And now that the Roman Empire had fallen to the barbarians, the restrainer had been removed and the Antichrist would appear. That's why they were looking for the Antichrist because they thought the restrainer was Rome. I don't know what your view is on the restrainer. Maybe it's Western civilization, and as it becomes collapsing down, we'll slide into, I mean, it seems like Western civilization is collapsing, to me at least. And what comes next? Anyway, in a work called The Second Apocalypse of John, yes, it's pseudepigraphal, but 650 is about its date, we will send my angel, I will send my angels over all the earth's surface. They will burn up the earth and the rocks will be melted and turned to dust. There were several, a series of commentaries on Revelation. And they all saw the fall of Rome as the beginning of the end. I, you can see their names, Caesarius, Aspringius, Beatus, Ambrose Altepert. Um, and then there's a man, Theodora Studios, who uh, said, when the stream of fire will usher forth, then save me from the flames that can never be cooled. These flames are coming very soon. This all comes from Francis Gummerlock's article, Apocalyptic Spirituality in the Early Middle Ages. By the way, all, most of his, all, all of his works that are published are on his webpage, francisgummerlock.com, if you want to take a look. But he said he found five or six more rapture passages. Um, they're usually not pre, they're usually mid-trib or or even a post-trib rapture, but it is a rapture before the time, length of time you can discuss. But, and he's presenting them at the Evangelical Theological Society conference just before Thanksgiving in Rhode Island. It's an annual conference of all the theologians. And in fact, I, I applied to speak there too, but they turned me down and they accepted him. I know three other people who were turned down, all dispensationalists. Now, this guy writes eschatology, but he's all mill. It's my theory that they accepted him because he was all mill and turned down myself and two other dispensationalists from speaking. And you don't really hear just, I think they're on the outs. We're on the outs with the theological elite in our country. Who's right? I'll let you decide. Anyway, but he's still my friend. I mean, we may disagree on theology, but... He's, he's finding stuff for me. And when I find stuff for him, I, I give it to him as well. Um, anyway, he, Gummerlock, was able to discover eight expectations of a pre-conflagration rapture. Now, what is that? It's a rapture where the, the church is taken up and then the earth with the ungodly are destroyed. And then the godly are brought back down on a new earth. Now, how long is that period? 
they said long enough to burn up the earth and refresh it. I guess God can do that in a day or so. And so uh, it, they never really stipulate how long this pre-conflagration rapture is. But going through them really quickly, Hilary of Portier, when the wrath of God rises, the saints will be hidden in God's chambers. But the faithless will be exposed to the celestial fires. Now, how long are they hidden in God's chambers? As a good pre-trib guy, I would say seven years. But he doesn't say seven years. He just says hidden in the chambers while the fire destroys the wicked. And then redeposited once again. Augustine of Hippo said, Augustine, the Amil guy, where shall the saints be during the conflagration? And before it is replaced with the new heavens and new earth? In upper regions. So he was ah mill, but he did believe that Christ would come back, rescue the church, destroy the earth, and then deposit the church back down. He gave no time period. I don't think he was pre-mill. He says he was, in his youth he was pre-mill. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, Julian of Toledo. Uh, by the way, this is before the Muslims took Toledo, of course. So actually, he was there alive when they did, but he was a, a Visigoth. Uh, uh, churchmen. Anyway, um, he, he basically repeated verbatim the words of Augustine, which was, the church will be up in the nether regions when the earth is destroyed. The venerable Bede, the great church historian of English church history, said, when the Lord descends for the judgment, the saints are immediately caught up to meet him in the air. He even cites 1 Thessalonians 4. As that passage being caught up in the air, fire then will cover the whole surface of the earth and the unjust will be unable to, to be caught up into heaven. They will be destroyed before God then redeposits the righteous back upon the earth. Brendan, he was actually a disciple of St. Patrick. Columba was too. In fact, there's St. Brendan. He's, he's pretty well known. If you were an Irish or a Scotsman, you would know who St. Brendan was. And he said, his, he said that his monks would be raised high over the fire of doom and then return. So he didn't say all the righteous, you know, my monks will be rescued. And then they'll start, you know, spreading the word on the new heavens and the new earth. Um, and then Hasatius Radbertus, the one who seeks the things that are, are of God will be taken. And the one who seeks the things which are of the world will be left behind in the fire. Pseudo Alkian. Now, Pseudo Alkian doesn't mean that he is fake. It's another guy by the name of Alkian. And maybe he's trying to pass himself off as the Alkian. Alkian was the chief churchman for uh, 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 Charlemagne. He kind of led Charlemagne's uh, 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 educational program and, and religious revival within Charlemagne's period. Uh, but this is a guy that lived about a century later, and maybe his name was Alcyon too. He just didn't say, I'm not the early Alcyon. He just said Alcyon, and people think, oh, you're trying to make yourself be like Alcyon. Hey, my name is William. There are a lot of Williams out there. I mean, I, I don't think that because we call him pseudo Alcyon that he is fake in any way. But he said in 1040, which would be 200 years after Alcyon, um, when the Lord comes for judgment, there will be a white cloud which, screening the saints, will protect them from the fire burning the world. Apparently, they'll be above, maybe sitting on the white cloud, underneath the world is destroyed. They'll be waiting in the clouds rather than in the chamber of the Lord in, the, in heaven, and then be deposited back on the earth. And then Bruno the Carthusian. Our Carthusians were an order of monks in the late Middle Ages, um, or Middle Middle Ages. But... Um, and he said, the faithful will be preserved unharmed from the fire. These are all what is known as pre-conflagration. We really don't know how long it would be. Now let's go to pre-trib. I think pre-trib is very clear that it, uh, to be pre-trib, you have to actually not be rescued from the fires that will destroy the earth, but rescued from the wrath of Antichrist. Whether it's a three and a half year tribulation or a seven year tribulation, I found both. But um, anyway.
he, he had, I think he had correct theology, but he was a millenarian. Um, but of course, third century, that's before Constantine. That can be expected. And uh, he's cited by several church fathers, and some of his own work does exist, but only in fragments, uh, papyri fragments. Um, he said, the Antichrist will set him up in, himself up in Jerusalem. Enoch and Elijah will return. So the two witnesses already in the third century, people think the two witnesses in the book of Revelation are Enoch and Elijah. And that's the general story I, I find throughout the medieval period. Uh, Enoch and Elijah will return and oppose him. And then, of course, he, the Antichrist will be executing them. When the, time of persecu when the end time persecution of the Antichrist intensifies that last three and a half years, Christ will take pity on his people by sending angels from heaven to snatch up the, uh, those who have the seal of God on their hands and their foreheads and remove them from the wrath of the Antichrist and lead them to paradise. There, the raptured saints will receive white robes, dwell in safety from the Antichrist. After this, Christ will return with those saints to the earth. And that would be probably a three and a half year, a, a great tribulation, which would be the last three and a half years. Maybe that would be a mid-tribulation uh, rapture. Yeah, some of these are kind of uh, gray areas between a pre-trib, a mid-trib. But he refers to the last three and a half years as really the tribulation. So maybe it's still pre-trib, only a three and a half year. Anyway, um, it's not pre-wrath, but pre-trib. Why? Right in the text. Its purpose is, according to Gummerlock, I mean, sorry. Uh, Gummerlock says its purpose is specifically related to the removal of the wrath of the Antichrist and escape from the tribulation sent on the world by God in the last days. And it really shows close affinity to the pre-tribulation works that you read today. Anyway but a three and a half year tribulation. Let's go to Andrew of Caesarea. Now this is not Caesarea Philippi in Northern Israel or Caesarea Maritime, which is on the coast of Israel, but another third Caesarea, which is kind of on the border between Cappadocia and Galatia in Central Asia Minor. He was a bishop there in Caesarea. Uh, 610 is about the time he wrote uh, the best guess at, at when it was written. By the hour of trial, he speaks of Antichrist at the end of time. So it's a commentary here. It's a commentary on the apocalypse. And he says, what is this trial? And I think it's the, the uh, Revelation 3, that they will be saved from the trial that will be upon the whole earth. Um, anyway, and he says, what it is, is the trial of the wrath of Antichrist. They're escaping the wrath of Antichrist and going to be with the Lord for that under three and a half year period, probably. Um, but it could be a seven-year period because he doesn't say, but it will be safe from the wrath of Antichrist. And that tells me it's pre-trib. Um, Pseudo-Ephraim. Pseudo-Ephraim was very popular a few years ago. He was actually discovered by Grant Jeffries. Anyone know who Grant Jeffries is? And of course, Grant Jeffries took it to Tommy Ice and Tommy Ice freaked out. Boy, you know, when I got a lot of this material, I started, con I contacted Dwight Pentecost just about two weeks before he passed away by email. He said, you got to let Tim LaHaye and Tommy Ice know about this. And so I, I did contact them. In fact, uh, I tried to figure out how to get a hold of him and was having trouble. But one of my former students was uh, Jerry Jenkins' son. And so I sent it to my former student who sent it to Jerry Jenkins' dad. And then he sent it to Tim LaHaye. And Tim LaHaye said, I want to meet you. Because I said, I've got scores of, you know, 20, 30, 40 sources of the, of the rapture, pre-trib rapture. And the next thing you know, he had me speaking at pre-trib and helped me to publish my book. So, you know, Tim LaHaye did pass away last summer, just about a year ago. But um, anyway, uh, but I'm glad that he didn't pass away earlier and, didn't, you know, he didn't help me with my book. <laughs> but anyway, uh, let's move on. Um, oh, I will say, as an academic, I'm not as dogmatic about pre-trib as a lot of the pre-trib people at the pre-trib conference. I'm convinced that it's true, but you know, if it's mid-trib, I wouldn't be that upset. Three and a half years is good enough. As I go through, I'll explain why it has to be some period of time, not just, you know, enough time to burn the earth. I mean, that's not, it doesn't really comport with the rest of scripture too much, just to rapture, burn the earth back. But that was a very popular expression in the medieval period. Anyway, um, pseudo Ephraim, all the saints, by the way, another pseudo, He's a guy named Ephraim, and he was from Syria. There is Ephraim, 
of Syria, who was the church father. This Ephraim came a little bit later. He could have been a student of Ephraim. And it could be that, that he's representing Ephraim in the next generation because it says, well, this is what I heard from Ephraim, but Ephraim never wrote it down. Uh, don't think that he's faking it and we can't trust him because he has pseudo. It could be, too, that Ephraim was a pretty popular name in Syria at that time. And they just said, I'm Ephraim, I'm in Syria. And people said, oh, you must have been the Ephraim of Syria, you know. And now we know that he wrote after, that he wrote after Ephraim of Syria. But it was probably influenced by Ephraim of Syria. Anyway, pseudo-Ephraim, in his sermon at the end of the world, uh, it actually, we found Syriac uh, manuscripts from the 6th and 7th centuries. And even some Greek and Latin from the 5th, 6th, and 7th centuries. So uh, it was well translated. It was first, in, I think, in Syriac, even though we found a Greek that's earlier. I'm sure there are some Syriac. He's from Syria. He probably wrote in Syriac and not in Greek. But how do we know? <laughs> anyway, all the saints and elect of God are gathered together before the tribulation. Before the tribulation, the saints and elect of God are gathered together from the tribulation which is to come and are taken to the Lord in order that they may not see at any time the confusion that overwhelms the world. So the saints are not going to experience the confusion of the Antichrist, the persecution of the Antichrist. They're going to be gathered together and whisked away during that period when the Antichrist rages. Um, of course, the, the, the two sorrows of the kingdom of heaven, which is a manuscript that was an Irish manuscript found in the 11th century, is really influenced by the apocalypse of, of Elijah. Must, must probably had a copy and rewrote it, but he rewrote it in, uh, I think it was in Gaelic at the time. But anyway, um, and then there's the history of Brother Dulcino. Brother Dulcino was in a monastery in Northern Italy. In fact, they had to flee from the wrath of the Roman Catholic Church. Monks who wanted to follow God and started to become apocalyptic and were persecuted by the Roman church because of that. And they fled north to the, the borders of Switzerland around Lake Como. I don't know if you know, far, the far northern border of Italy and Switzerland. But they were not that far. They were around Milan area when they had to go flee north to get away from the persecution of the Catholic church. Um, and Brother Dulcino, in fact, Brother Dulcino was actually found by Gummerlock, and he's, he's, he's published a lot on it, and it's out there now. Um, anyway, the Apostolic Brethren are the monastic group. Brother Dulcino was their leader. And he said, the Antichrist was coming into the world within the bounds of the said three and a half years. Maybe it's a mid-trip. Um, and after that, he had come, uh, transferred in, they're transferred into paradise. They're unharmed during the persecution of the Antichrist. And at the end, when Christ comes back, they will descend with him to rule with him in the millennium. Now, I'm going to go really fast on nine expectations of a mid-trib rapture. Uh, Tychonius, who was a Donatist, they were a group that um, rejected Rome. They were called heretics because they rejected the Pope in Rome, but also because they they felt that if you did, re denied Christ in the persecution of the Roman Empire, that you'd lost your salvation. And so I guess we could call them heretics, but I'm not as hard on them as the Catholics are. And, and he, he comes up with a mid-trib rapture. In the Acts of Pilate, there's a mid-trib rapture. Prometheus, the Venerable Bede, comes up with a mid-trib rapture. Uh, Alpert of Ambrose. I mean, we can, you can go through this list. I'm going to skip it because I want enough time for questions. The church must be in heaven long. I'm going to be dogmatic here. The church must be in heaven long enough for a wedding. Seven years, three and a half years. I'll go for three and a half days. But it's got to be long enough for a wedding. A preparation of the bride. She'll be clothed in white garments. Then she will return to earth with Christ in her fine, white fine linen. I'm convinced of that if you read, I, I think it's Revelation 19, isn't it? Holy of course is in there too, where you have the wedding supper of the lamb. You know, the, the preparation of the bride, the wedding, the wedding supper. The very next verse after the wedding supper, Christ on his white horse comes, right? And who is in his train following him? Saints in white garments, who was just given in the previous three or four verses, white garments for wedding. The bride. We will return with him. And if we're going to return from heaven with him, we'll have to have been in heaven to be able to come out of heaven with him. Now, you can argue about how long you want that time that we're in heaven. 
I, my default position is seven years. But if it's ever proven to me that I'm wrong, I'll go with three and a half. I'll hold on to as much of it as I can. Anyway, uh, you can see there are three, uh, a springus of Beja that actually is in Spain, uh, Primaceus, I've quoted him already, the Venerable Bede, who's up in uh, Northern England, um, actually at what, Linden's Farn Mon Monastery, I think is where he was based. Anyway, let's move on. The medieval, there was a medieval tradition of a last godly emperor who fought against Gog and Magog. And we find this throughout the Middle Ages that there'll be one last god, uh, godly emperor and he will, Gog, Gog and Magog, probably the Mongols, coming into Europe and they'll be able to save him. But then the Anti, when he dies, the Antichrist will take over. And you find that in the, in the Tributurna Sibyl, uh, in Pseudo-Methodius. Uh, you can see Friedrich Barbarossa, who was in the Third Crusade with Richard the Lionhearted and King Philip of France. Well, on the way there, he, they were in Asia Minor crossing a river and Friedrich Barbarossa fell into the river. He had black armor. With all the other horses in the river, there was so much muck that it was about an hour before they pulled him out. But it, because he was in his armor, he sunk to the bottom of the river. And he was the, the Holy Roman Emperor, the Emperor of Germany. And many of the Germans went back and left poor old Richard the Lionhearted to go after Saladin on his own. But anyway, um, uh, there's, in fact, there's been this long medieval legend that Barbarossa will come back again and defeat the powers of the East, Gog and Magog. And Hitler made a lot of that in, the, in, in Nazi mythology, believe it or not. What did he name the invasion into Russia where Gog and Magog was supposed to come from? Operation Barbarossa from that very myth. But anyway, I wish I had more time, but I've got to skip a lot of this stuff. You can see my sources at the bottom if you're interested. Um, now, in the second to the fifth century, there's a tradition of a Jewish antichrist. My um, uh, medieval tradition, um, the, what, I found that uh, in, in my manuscript from the Wycliffe period, um, that the antichrist was to be a Jew from the tribe of Dan and that he would then restore the temple. The Jews would believe him because he was Jewish. Why would the Jews follow a Gentile Antichrist? But if the Jews are going to be the ones who follow the Antichrist, he will rebuild the temple. But then when he rebuilds the temple, he'll then desecrate his own temple that he's rebuilt and claim himself to be God. And that is a, a, a myth that it pervades as early as Irenaeus mentioned it. Hippolytus, a disciple of Irenaeus, went into even more depth on it. Cyril of Jerusalem, Jerome, Theodore of, of Cyr also believed that. Let's go on. It went throughout the Middle Ages with Primaceus, Gregory the Great, Andreas, John of Damascus. All of these are, are following that line that, that the, and again, there are biblical reasons for it. Remember that Dan is not mentioned as one of the tribes in Revelation when there's the 12 tribes and you know, the 144,000. And so why? Because Dan is the rejected tribe, because just as one of the 12 disciples was Judas, one of the 12 tribes, that's why Dan had to be replaced with what, Ephraim, Manasseh. I, again, I'm, I'm not a theologian. You can do a better job with me on that. But I keep running into this all the time. And boy, I've got to wrap it up in five minutes. Okay. Um, the, the, by the way, the medieval tradition of a future papal antichrist, the earliest pope Antichrist is Arnulf of Reims, 991. He was an archbishop of Reims. He was actually the illegitimate son of the last Carolingian king. And when the they, they went from the, uh, the when the French changed dynasties and got rid of the last Carolingian king, he was kind of in the way. The Pope sided against him. The Pope sided with the new French monarchy. So he called the Pope the Antichrist. But it's the first evidence that we, and of course, in the investiture struggle, where I don't know, who gets to name a bishop? Does the Holy Roman Emperor get to name him or the Pope get to name it? And actually, prior to the, the reinvigoration of the, of the papacy in the 11th century, uh, I don't know if you know the, the papal reformation that took place starting in 1071, but, but we had weak popes before that. And usually the king of France named the bishops in France. The Holy Roman Emperor named the bishops in Germany and Central Europe. Um, and all of a sudden, now we have stronger popes that are insisting that the pope has the power to do that. And there's that struggle. Well, there were many different cl uh, clerics, um, bishops, who sided with the Holy Roman Emperor against the pope, who then called the pope the Antichrist. But this idea of a papal Antichrist, Bernard of Clairvaux and Hildegard of Bingen, uh, Bingen had a vision that the last, both of them had visions that the last pope 
would be an anti-pope, that the last pope would be the antichrist. In fact, I still hear, even from Catholics, you know, they say, well, Hildegard of Bingen had this vision. Actually, Bernard of Clairvaux believed her vision that the last pope would be the Antichrist. And it's been echoed by, throughout even the Roman, I know Roman Catholics that believe the last pope is going to be the Antichrist. And many people, I know Catholics now that are saying, this new pope is so weird with gays and transgender and things like that, that they're saying, is this the last pope who's going to be the Antichrist? Tossing things out, I hope you're interested, and I probably have two more minutes. Um, Joachim of Fiori and the rigorous Franciscans, they were the, the Franciscans split into the liberal Franciscans and the strict Franciscans. And the strict Franciscans were persecuted and driven out and they became eschatological. Usually when they're persecuted by the Catholic Church, they become eschatological. Uh, you can see other groups, the Lollards and the Taborites, who are followers of Wycliffe and Huss, eschatological. Usually when you're persecuted, you become eschatological. Um, now, an another slide. Belief that God will be returning to the Jews in the last days, that the time of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. And once again, a lot of them maybe not, some of them do mention a rapture where the Gentiles take off, but others that in some way God will return to the Jews as his people and work with the Jews in the last days. And you can see the four that are my sources for that, even though we're out of time. I wanted to show you the cover of this book, if you are a Messianic Jew and you really are interested, he does the same thing I do, but only with Jewish authors. Every century, filled with Jewish authors who are expecting, the, the, some of them are even false messiahs, who are claiming, I'm the Messiah, follow me. We're going to march on Jerusalem and rebuild the temple and defeat the Ottoman Empire. One of my favorites was, uh, uh, if I see if I can find, find his name, um, Oh, Zabati Zevi, the last one. He, he was actually in Ephesus or Smyrna, I think it was Smyrna, when he declared himself the, the uh, Jewish Messiah and called all Jews to gather in the Ottoman Empire and march on Jerusalem and rebuild the temple and rebuild Jerusalem. The Ottoman uh, Sultan captured him, imprisoned him, and gave him a choice. Convert to Islam or be executed. He converted to Islam. And all of his followers were dejected and realized he wasn't the Messiah. And that was the end. But, there were, but in this book, there are a lot of, of pseudo-Messiahs, 22 or more that he counts. My conclusion. Okay. Dispensationalists, I'm repeating my introduction, really. Dispensationalists ex expected any time and speculate on the apocalypse. Anti-dispensationalists make fun of us, disparage us. They say we're nuts. They say our eschatological ideas of the last days are new. No, they're the new ones because they're affected by modernism, by liberalism. Prophecy is a major theme of scripture, a major theme of the teaching of Christ. Throughout church history, you'll find them. Not Catholic officials, they don't want these ideas, but those who were trying to seek and follow God from the heart and were persecuted. Therefore, when you get mocked by these liberal modernists, they mocked Noah when he was building the ark. I'm not, that's, that's enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Appreciate that very much. We have questions for you. Uh, I thought your, your talk was stimulating. I thought okay. the uh, pre-conflagration rapture was very interesting. So... Uh, a lot of great stuff in there, so we'll get some questions for you. Uh, all right, we'll get started with these. Okay, so first up, why does the marriage supper of the Lamb have to be in heaven rather than on earth at his return? Well, we come out of heaven. Where else would it be? I'm open to a suggestion. I mean, Christ comes down from heaven with people in white robes, and those white robes were just given to them at the wedding. Now, whether you want to accept literal white robes or not, the people that married the lamb followed, but wait, wait it says when we go to heaven, we will always be with the Lord. He's not gonna leave us in heaven when he comes back to kick some serious butt at the battle of Armageddon. Where he is, we will be also. Dispensationalists right? <laughs> talk about some people repopulating the earth in their normal bodies during the millennium. They believe these to be people who became believers after the pre-trib rapture. 
Could it be Israel that repopulates the earth in normal bodies during this time because God in his grace lets them tear their robes and repent at his second coming on the last day? I know that when we return with him from heaven, we will rule with him. Maybe he's going to give us some. What would I want? I kind of like Estes Park. I love Estes Park. That's what I can rule. But anyway, um, but there will be mortals at that time, and we will be rulers, not mortals. I'm pretty sure. Now, I mean, I'm, I could, maybe I'll be wrong, but my best guess is that we will rule with him. If we rule with him, who are we going to rule over? I would believe people living in the millennium at the time. Maybe we'll be like angels. Not that we are angels. I mean, they're not angels. Angels are another creation. But, but maybe we'll, there'll be another tier in the great chain of being from God to insects. And that'll be us above the millennial populace. That'll be regular people who will then rebel against the Lord in, in the second Gog and Magog at the end of the, of the millennium. You know that, that story. So did I answer it all right? Yeah, I think so. Are you suggesting that Christ is going to be hosting a wedding banquet while his own Jewish brethren are being persecuted and slaughtered during the time of Jacob's trouble? Yeah. Now you're Jewish. How do you feel about that? As things are going to be pretty bad on the earth. Well, and I would say here? the focus of that badness is the Antichrist going after the Jewish people. Could we have a wedding at the time of that going on? Well, we'll be with the Lord. We will know everything. I don't think we'll be despairing. I'm still working on it. But, <laughs> but I mean, if that's what the Bible says, I think. And so, hey, but think about it. Before things get really bad, we're going to come back with them. And did you ever see read the last Chronicles of Narnia book where the, the great battle at the end and the, and the children are there too fighting? That's where C.S. Lewis gets it too. We're going to be right there with the Lord. And we're going to win. And we're going to rescue Israel. Why should an end time Christian generation be considered more worthy than previous generations to escape man's wrath, uh, Hebrew 11, 35 through 40, comparable to the Antichrist's wrath? I mean, do we have to be worthy to, to deserve the rapture? I, I hope I got this right. I mean, I'm unworthy, a sinner, saved by grace. I, have I dealt with that question adequately? I think, sure. Okay. Um, I think this is probably our last question for, for time's sake. Uh, the white garments are given to those martyrs that come out of the great tribulation. How can they, excuse me, how can they be the church that was... Uh, raptured that was in the okay, right, rapture. Right. now to come out of the great tribulation does that mean they were martyred in the middle of the tribulation and therefore i'm open to the fact that people that miss the rapture but yet get martyred by antichrist join the church isn't there a passage that says blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb maybe they're not the bride but they've just been martyred, and hey, we got the bride prepared. It's just about to be have the wedding. Come on in. Uh, I, all I can do is guess. Yeah, but, but I would say that the, those who are martyred, if it's in the midst of the, of the tribulation, they very likely are included um, because of their martyrdom. Um, but uh, maybe the rapture is in the middle of the tribulation and the coming out of. But again, to say coming out of the tribulation, does that mean it has to be in the middle of the tribulation? Couldn't have been at the beginning of the tribulation? And again, I don't think any of us can be dogmatic about any of this stuff. We can just do the best guess we can. Thank you. I really appreciate your humble spirit and all the great research you've given us. So thank you, Dr. Watson.